morning everyone. Uh, so yesterday we talked about a few different applications that we can do for um, using these uh, spontaneous redox reaction. Uh, one of which was a redox titration and that's the question I want to start off with here. Uh, so just for a warm-up. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, an experiment here. A 25 milliliter HNO2 solution is reacted with excess Ki, give you the equation, uh, 2 HNO2, uh, 2 I minus, 2 H plus becomes 2 NO and iodine and 2 waters. Uh, the produced I2 requires 14.6 milliliters of 0 0.150 molar uh, sodium thiosulfate. And we'll give you that equation as well. For these equations, they'll probably have balanced it for you because they want to test uh, whether you understand the uh, redox titration. Uh, if they wanted to check whether you can do balancing, they can do that in a separate question. Uh, this question here is asking you uh, determine the unknown uh, concentration of HNO2. Okay. So I'd encourage you to pause this video here. Uh, you can try it out for yourself, and then when you come back, you can check your work with me here. Uh, as always, I want to start off with a picture. Uh, our final goal is to start off with this HNO2 solution. Right now here, it's an unknown concentration of HNO2. So I know the uh, chemical is nitrous acid, HNO2, but I don't know molarity. Uh, I start off with 25 milliliters of it. So this one here has an unknown amount of this nitrous acid. What you do is you react it with an excess of Ki. So you toss in a ton of Ki. Why Ki? Ki actually, uh, as a salt, is going to release iodide uh, ions. So the HNO2 here, there's an unknown amount of it. If there is HNO2 in solution, if it runs into I minus, I see that in the equation, it also needs to be acidic conditions. So, so far, as I've drawn in the picture, if I don't guarantee that there's actually acid in solution here, without this H plus here, this reaction can't run. Now, fortunately for us here, HNO2 itself is already an acid. Uh, sometimes you even toss in excess acid anyways. That's just a condition that I need to have enough H plus to allow HNO2 to actually react with I minus. We saw that on the redox table, if I had an H plus in the equation, uh, if they didn't tell me it was acidified, I need to skip over that reaction. But there we go. We're going to toss in an excess I minus. We toss in a ton of I minus. Some of this I minus gets converted over to become I2. So we're going to have created a bunch of I2 here. Because we didn't know, necessarily know how much HNO2 there was, I toss in so much Ki, there's probably extra iodide around here. But that's OK. Because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to count how much I2 is in solution using the second reaction. The I2 is going to react with uh, sodium thiosulfate. Again, why sodium thiosulfate here? Well, this one here is an alkali salt. This is soluble. It's going to break out to become 2 sodium plus and 1 S2O3 uh, minus 2. So actually, this information that they tell me about the sodium thiosulfate is in a 1 to 1 ratio with thiosulfate. That's actually giving you information about this S2O3. Uh, this reaction here would look something like uh, I have in my barrette. Uh, this is my technically my sodium thiosulfate solution. I just care about the thiosulfate part of it. I drop this in slow enough into my uh, beaker that actually contains my uh, iodine that was produced. And as long as there is still I2 in this Erlenmeyer here, as you drop in S2O3, S2O3 will start killing off the I2, converting the I2 back into I-. So I drop in and drop S2O3. If it finds an I2, cancels out. Finds an I2, cancels out. I'm looking for the equivalence point when I just have a perfect count of how much I2 there is. That's the point I want to stop. Uh, yesterday, I sort of alluded to here, uh, I2 itself already has like a sort of uh, maybe purplish, even brownish uh, kind of undertone. Uh, usually what you would do is you throw in a starch indicator because starch and iodine actually turns out to be a really, really deep blue color. As you throw in starch, for some reason when they describe this procedure, usually it's like, oh, toss in a little bit of thiosulfate first and then add the starch later. I just tell people, just throw in the starch right away. As long as there's I2, Instead of this uh, sort of uh, grayish or sort of undertone, uh, it's going to show a nice blue color. So that as the thiosulfate kills off the iodine, if there is no longer any iodine to react with, uh, the starch is just going to show a colorless solution. So it's much easier to tell when the solution here, sort of the blue color disappears, to tell us when the reaction is done. 
And overall, what we're going to do is we're going to take this S203 uh, minus 2. This is going to help us count how much iodine it reacted with. Where did the iodine come from? Iodine was also in a 1 to 2 ratio with HNO2. Uh, even though this is two equations, we're going to end up um, doing our mole ratios back to the starting equation. So uh, let's just do this all in one step here. We want to know the concentration of HNO2. Always start off with the chemical that we know the most stuff, so which is actually the thiosulfate. For the thiosulfate here, I know the volume. I'm going to convert it to liters. 0 0.0146 liters. This is talking about sodium thiosulfate. Again, one-to-one -one ratio with just the thiosulfate ion. The concentration of the thiosulfate was 0 0.150 moles for a given liter. Why do we care about moles? Is because uh, everything follows a mole ratio. So if I have two parts thiosulfate, SCO3, that's in a 2 to 1 ratio with I2. Uh, the I2 had actually come from the first solution. I2 is in a 1 to 2 ratio. For every 1 mole I2 in the first equation, that actually counts 2 moles of HNO2. That's actually the only thing that create iodine. In this case here, because my final answer should actually have moles of HNO2 on top divided by liters, I now have canceled out everything except for moles of HNO2. I just need to know the starting volume of uh, HNO2. Well, we started off with 25 milliliters, so I'm going to divide it by 1 over 0 0.02500 liters, and that would end up giving you this concentration. So just punch all the numbers in here. 0 0.0146 times 0.15 divide 2 times 2 divide 0 0.025 gives me a concentration of 0 0.0876. Uh, All right. Um, some people, as they look at this here, they start getting worried. Well, the second equation, as I convert the iodine, doesn't that go back into from iodide? I already had some extra iodide in the solution. That's fine because the thiosulfate only reacts with the iodine form. So sure, it converts the I2 back into I minus. That's a reduction reaction. Uh, but the only thiosulfate will react with I2. I knew that I2 had come from HNO2 as a solution. Okay. So hopefully that helps you recap a little bit of uh, this redox titration bit here. Uh, what we're going to do over the next two classes is we're going to switch over to take a look at an electrolytic cell. So let me just give you an overview here. We are still going to be using the same electrochem table. Um, it's exactly the same procedure. We want to just sort of identify what chemicals are present, find the best guy that can reduce, starting from the top left, find the best guy that can oxidize, uh, but here are some of the key differences. Uh, in the newest sort of way of framing this here, they've now used the term electrochemical cell or electrochemistry. Electrochemical cell is sort of an umbrella term. So far, we've been looking at what are referred to as voltaic cells. A voltaic cell is essentially a battery. If you think about that there, a voltaic cell actually uses a spontaneous chemical reaction, right? The battery, once you just plug into your device, the chemicals in the battery already generate an electrical uh, voltage. You don't need to charge the battery first. So a spontaneous chemical reaction uh, generates uh, electricity or generates some uh, voltage, some potential. Because the reaction here was spontaneous, we find that the E0, the total E cell of the battery, is actually going to be positive because the battery is supposed to supply me some uh, voltage to actually run my devices. Because the reaction was already spontaneous, we needed this to actually occur in two different half cells. One half cell occurs on the left, one half cell occurs on the right. We force the electrons to travel from anode to cathode through the wiring. We needed that salt bridge here so that I could taper off the voltage uh, as the electrons flowed in one direction. Today what we're going to start doing is we're going to look at an opposite type of cell this type of cell here, we're going to refer to as an electrolytic cell. Right. Do this in more detail very shortly here, but electrolytic, you're using electricity to light light something, meaning to break something, using electricity to cause some reaction to occur. So here's the key difference here. The reaction itself will actually be non-spontaneous. The chemicals just don't react. Okay. However, it's an important reaction that I actually want to actually uh, form. Let's say my battery is a dead battery. I want to actually force my reaction to go the opposite way. I want to replenish some of those uh, reagents there so that my battery can uh, run again. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a non-spontaneous reaction. A non-spontaneous reaction is caused, I'm focusing on the chemistry here, is caused by uh, inputting electricity. So this one here will actually need an external power supply because the reaction is non-spontaneous, we're going to see, yes, we're going to still calculate E cell, right, the total of the reduction potential and the oxidation potential, but we're actually going to have a negative E cell. 
this is not just, oh, this voltage is actually worse than hydrogen. In fact, if you add up both half cells, it's still a negative voltage. This reaction just simply doesn't happen. So that's one key difference here. We don't need to have it in two beakers. We just have to have it in one beaker because the chemicals just don't combine, right? The reaction is not favorable. What we're going to do is we're going to be using an external power supply. Power supply is here for a battery. The symbol is usually long lines and short lines, any number of them. The long line is actually the positive side. The short line is actually the negative side, okay? We're going to use an external power supply, and hopefully by using this power supply, this uh, external, this itself would have to be a battery or plugging into a wall socket or something, and this uh, electrical energy can actually cause a chemical reaction to run. Other than that, the reaction wouldn't have run. So just one beaker, and we need to have an um, uh, electrolytic uh, system. Okay. So for example, uh, there's a reaction. This is called the electrolysis of water. We can take water. We're not talking ionization. We're not talking about it breaking up, but we're talking about actually decomposing water. Water just sitting there is not going to suddenly decompose to become H2 and O2. One way you can cause this reaction to occur is thermal decomposition. So sometimes they say heat. What we're going to do this time is we're actually going to electrolyze it using electricity. So we're going to use this external power supply. We're going to use electricity to perform this lysis to rip apart the water. Sure, we're going to need to do this balancing here. Two waters, uh, 2H2 and 1H2. So that what's going to happen is, based on the power supply, we're going to bubble hydrogen on one side, bubble oxygen on the other side. We're going to cause a reaction to occur based on my battery. Okay. Now we're going to steadily sort of increase difficulty up to that cell. Uh, we're going to look at a few different setups here, starting off with the easiest cell. We'll call this one here a type 1 cell. Uh, so let's say A. A type 1 cell, a type 1 uh, electrolysis cell. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is we're looking at the electrolysis of uh, what's referred to as a molten salt with inert electrodes. As we step over to type 2 and type 3 cell here, we're slowly going to change things up here. The key phrase here for type 1 cell is we have a molten salt. Molten always scared me away when I saw it here. Molten just refers to the solution being melted. It refers to the solution in being the liquid state here. And in fact, I really shouldn't be using the word solution. Solution usually implies it's aqueous, there's water around. In this case, nope, I've taken a, a salt. Uh, let's say it's a salt, uh, NaCl, sure, table salt. Instead of dropping it in water and actually forming an aqueous solution here, we're actually going to uh, basically heat it up to 700, 800 degrees. Basically, at those really hot temperatures, we've ripped apart the lattice. We are still going to get any plus ions, still going to get Cl minus, but this time, instead of it being aqueous and worried about water, this time we're actually going to have almost like a lava of the salt here. So I have liquidy sodium ions, liquidy uh, chloride ions. Uh, I'm also specifying here, so far I'm going to have inner electrodes. I don't want the electrodes to interfere as well. Uh, the types of inner electrodes that we have so far is we've had uh, platinum and carbon. I'm going to call one platinum, one carbon. They could have both been carbon, both been platinum, but this way we can actually see some difference. Okay. Remember, this reaction here is so far it's unreactive. So it's okay for you to just be one beaker. I'm telling you we have molten NaCl. You're going to just make a list of exactly what you have. In the molten state, we've actually broken apart the compound. I have Na plus and I have Cl minus. Notice that because we're in liquid, that's actually the key difference here. Uh, we have no water since it is not aqueous solution. Now, usually water is just in the background anyways, right? For all the electrochemical, all the voltaic cells so far, we've just been like, yeah, water's in the present, but other chemicals react before water, who cares? In this case here, it does really matter because by the time we find out the best guy reducing, we're going to find out water very often has actually reduced before it. So water interferes a lot. I usually say water is really annoying. But aside from that here, we have sodium ions, we have chloride ions here. We do need a power supply because the, um, uh, the reaction here wouldn't occur by itself. The long line is the positive side. The short line is the negative side here. I can even give you this one here. It's totally up to us which way we flip the battery. I could have put the positive pointing on the right-hand side or the left-hand side here. The positive side for a voltaic cell is the anode, and we're going to see why in a second. Okay. So, so far, my list of chemicals I want to look for on the table, I'm going to look for sodium ions, I'm going to look for chloride ions. I would have had to look for platinum and carbon, but those were already told to me they're inert. So don't bother. You're not going to find them. 
No need for a salt bridge even because we're already all in the same container. Exactly the same procedure. I want you to take the same table, start from the top left. These reactions here are written as reduction reactions. The strongest guys that reduce, the strongest oxidized agents are starting from the top left. You're going to go down and you're going to try to find your matches. And you need to find an exact match. So we're going to go down here just to hint at my type 2 cell. You're going to realize, oh, I actually run into water once. I run into water again way before I actually run into sodium. All right. So if I were doing this uh, in an aqueous solution, we could see this in a type 2 cell. If I were doing this in aqueous, who's going to reduce better? Is it water or sodium ions? Well, the stronger things are higher up on the table, I'd actually say water is supposed to reduce first. Fortunately for us, because I actually want to uh, invest in the sodium actually reacting, I've made this a molten solution. We had no water present. We actually have none of this water, none of this water here. So really, yes, the only guy that can react is this sodium here. On the table, is written as an equilibrium. But now that I know the direction, I can just write here, well, sodium plus gains an electron, one-way arrow, ends up forming chunks of sodium solid. The voltage here, just for this half cell, reduction potential is negative 2.71 volts, okay? So there we go. We are still finding the best guy reducing. It's just the chemicals we're looking at are so bad at reducing. Even water would have reduced before it, but in this case here, it's just sodium ions. As I go on the other side here, uh, start from the bottom right, right? Start from the bottom right. These are the guys that uh, oxidize best. It's just by the time you're gonna find your first match, you're gonna be fairly far up the table. Up to this point, your voltaic cells, we had always found that the reduction reaction still was above the oxidation arrow. But this time, you'll notice the reduction is happening so low on the table that as I go from the bottom right, as I go upwards, do I have sodium? I had sodium ion. I don't have sodium electrode. So skip it. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You're going to find water is really annoying. You're going to find water just by itself. I find water once here. I find water again. And then finally, I run into chloride here. So if there was water present in solution, looking at this table and looking at who actually uh, reduces better, we actually find, again, water reduces better than even the chloride does. So in this case here, fortunately for us, because we're molten, we have no water. We have to skip water. We have to skip water. Phew. Finally, we can get just our chloride reaction uh, in reacting here. Uh, actually, there's a chloride reaction that happens right before that. The chloride actually uh, ends up uh, oxidizing. Um, as the uh, at the uh, anode, okay. So I'm gonna write that reaction out uh, exactly here. So it's written right to left. I'm just gonna write it right uh, left to right here. So two chloride actually becomes chlorine. I'm gonna emphasize that as chlorine gas here. This is gonna become two electrons. This voltage again is written as a reduction potential. So if chlorine gas comes forwards, it's positive 1.36. Going in reverse here, I flip the sign negative 1.36. I don't necessarily care about these half cells that could be positive or negative. The half cell that I care, or the total E voltage I care about is when you add up these two voltages here, overall, we actually still are negative, okay? So let's do our balancing here. Remember on the half cell, your equations are already balanced. We want to do lowest common multiple between two and one here. So let's double the N2 equation. When I double this equation, yes, technically I double the energy, but doubling the energy carriers, the voltage stays the same. Let's just write out the reaction then. So overall, two chloride reacts with two sodium ions. I don't bother showing the electrons because I set them up to cancel out. We're going to end up forming bubbles of chlorine gas. You have to be careful of that. And then chunks of sodium solid. They're going to very often ask you, well, what is the overall E cell of this battery here? The overall E cell uh, is uh, just a adding these two here, uh, negative 1.36 uh, minus the 2.71, it gives me a negative uh, 4.07 volts. Okay. Now, this is the first time we saw this. The total voltage comparing the two half cells, it's actually a negative overall. That negative means actually non-spontaneous. And how you actually interpret that number is we need to supply at least a voltage of 4.07. There was a difference that this was actually keeping the reaction from occurring you need to input a positive 4.07 from the battery. Not that hard to do, but I need to input a positive 4.07 uh, to uh, cause the reaction to occur. Right? Otherwise, this reaction won't happen. It's like a dead battery. Uh, the products won't spontaneously reform reactants. Okay? 
Uh, in fact, due to sort of losses uh, to surroundings, I lose uh, energy in the form of heat. Um, usually, I might need to put in maybe a 10 volt battery because it's not 100% efficient. Uh, at a minimum, we need to supply 4.07 to actually cause that reaction to occur. Now, why did I call the anode side positive and the cathode side negative? So, anode, we're going to keep the definition here, and ox cared. Anode is always the site of oxidation. It's the location where oxidation occurs. Which one of these is oxidation? Well, oxidation here is a loss of electrons. Chloride is the thing that actually lost electrons. So what chloride is going to do here, the chloride in solution, it's like a table salt um, ion here. Chloride is going to swim close to platinum. That's the temporary uh, metal plate where it can drop off its electrons. Chlorine is going to, going to bubble off to become chlorine gas. Because uh, we're getting gas underwater, we're going to get bubbles of chlorine gas forming on this side. So bubbles of CO2 gas. That is a toxic gas. You know, be really careful as I'm doing this here. But we end up forming bubbles. Uh, electrons never enter solution. The electrons are just dropped off temporarily on this platinum plate here. The platinum is just forming a conducting circuit surface. It actually doesn't interfere at all. Those electrons start out on this side. The only reason why the electrons, electrons are still going to flow, electrons flow anode to cathode, and try to keep all my other uh, definitions the same here. The only way for the electrons to actually go from left to right is for me to pause, put the positive end of the battery there. Uh, opposites attract. Electrons like going towards the positive terminal. The battery here forces it farther than it wants to be, so pushes it up to the negative side. As the electrons arrive on this side here, they're going to push the people beside them. Being a negative charge, they hate the negative end, and they're going to want to go to the opposite side. So the positive side is always the anode for an electrolytic cell. Uh, upon going to the other side, what's going to reduce? The sodium ions swim up close to the chloride. They're going to pick up the electrons that arrive here, and they're going to deposit themselves as sodium solid. Um, sodium solid here would actually be explosive water, so it's a good thing that there's actually no water present. In this case here, because I'm actually forming sodium solid, we can actually say the mass of this cathode actually increases because we're actually having chunks of uh, sodium on top of it there. Okay, So uh, when I ask you to sort of make the observations, you don't need to memorize it. Once you figure out what's the best guy reducing, the best guy oxidizing, you just refer to the product. Oh, the product here is actually gaseous. We get bubbles. Oh, this product here is solid. Even though the electrode itself was actually carbon, it wasn't a sodium chunk. That was fine. I'm plating sodium on top of carbon. Okay, That's going to be a type 1 cell here. Aside from that, everything else is still the same. Find the best guy that reduces. Find the best guy that oxidizes. We're just going to find that the reduction reaction occurs way below the uh, re uh, the the reduction reaction occurs way below the oxidation reaction, that's going to guarantee that the overall E cell is actually negative. Okay, So we're going to steadily make it harder here. Uh, we're switching from a type 1 cell. Overall, there's three types. Uh, we're going to do the first two today. Uh, second one here, let's call this a type 2 cell. So type 2 cell here, I also find this section here very systematic. You do the same procedure, but steadily, as they change things up, there's going to be more chemicals that can actually react. So here I'm going to do the electrolysis of an aqueous salt. Okay, instead of a molten salt, instead of heating up to 600, 700 degrees for a liquid salt, this time here it actually is aqueous. A couple of ways we can say aqueous. We're going to usually be at standard state. So they say one molar, we're going to have water. If they definitely put the word solution, we're going to have a one molar or aqueous. That's going to mean we have water present. And so far I'm going to still keep the uh, electrodes as inert. The electrodes were just conducting plates, maybe the carbon, maybe the platinum here, and they're just going to sit there, temporarily hold the electrons so that the electrons can end up passing by. So uh, let's do the electrolysis. Maybe they just say, uh, let's go uh, K, um, KF as a salt. Okay? So I want to electrolyze KF uh, in an aqueous solution with inner electrodes. So they might just say KF. Uh, aqueous. They might even say one molar to remind you that it's actually um, uh, a solution. As you make a listing of what do you have in this container, we know this ionic compound here at first was a lattice, but seeing as it's actually become aqueous, being an alkali salt, this one is completely ripped apart to become K plus and F minus. So what I have is actually uh, the ions, right? I don't actually have Kf anymore. I want to make an exact list, so I don't have K solid, I don't have fluorine gas here. I just had the ions here. 
but this time instead of it being molten, instead of it being a melted lava, a liquid, we actually do have aqueous. So because they told me aqueous, as I make my list, I have K plus, I have F minus, I do actually need to worry about water as well. Okay? We're still dealing with inner electrodes, let's flip them around here, let's say carbon and platinum here. Let's still keep the uh, positive side of the battery on the left side, totally up to you which side you wanted to put in, but the positive side we just said has to be the anode so that electrons get pulled up towards the battery and the cathode is going to be opposite. Aside from that, we're going to do exactly the same procedure. So I'm going to look for these three chemicals. I have K plus in solution, I have F minus, and I have water in solution. Start from the top left. These are written as reductions. The top left is going to tell me who reduces best. Uh, we're going to be, no surprise, looking really, really far down the table because we're looking at things that are really bad at reducing, really bad at oxidizing. Notice that I do run into water. I run into water again before I run into K+. Okay. Now in a type 1 cell, we were uh, molten salt. We had no water, so we could totally skip over these two water equations. This time, because we actually do have water, even though we sort of made this uh, uh, added uh, effort to actually throw in Kf, we actually find water reduces before K+. And between the two water equations, we're actually going to find uh, the top water equation. This reduces. I pretty much uh, don't see this other reaction occur. And if you just see sort of what's happening here, essentially it's the same thing. I'm sure the balancing is a little bit different. But we're going to get H2, bubbles of hydrogen gas. But the difference here is hydroxide. There is that pesky little 10 to the negative 7. That actually is what we need at 25 degrees to be neutral. Whereas if the reaction, if this reaction were forced to occur, this is actually going to form hydroxide, more hydroxide than uh, neutral solution. So that's actually going to be basic. So we find our first match. Let's just write it out here. On the table, it's written as a... Um, two-way arrow. I want to show it as a one-way arrow. This guy gains two electrons. It reduces, becomes H2 gas, and two hydroxide, 10 to the negative 7 molar. Okay. The voltage of that here is written as a reduction already. The uh, potential for that half cell, negative uh, 0 0.41. Right. So between the water and the K+, plus, the water actually uh, reduces before K+. Plus. K+, plus is actually a spectator. It didn't really even have to be there. What about going on the oxidation side? As you go on the oxidation side, can I stop at K? Well, I have K+, plus. I don't have K electrode. So keep going. Skip over, skip over, skip over, right? There's a lot of these other reactions that actually need water, but those are just for the balancing. I would need the other chemical as well. I don't have those. The only time water appears then by itself, I have water appearing again. We have water again. And then the time we run into F-, minus, F- minus is actually so bad at uh, oxidizing, it's actually the farthest one up. So what's actually happening here is on the uh, bottom right side, these are the strongest reducing agents. Those are the best guys oxidizing. We actually see, wait a second, water actually does the reaction. This water equation is what happens. It's written um, left to right here, so I'm going to flip it around. The oxidation is actually water, one-way arrow, ends up forming half an O2 plus 2H plus, 10 to the negative 7 molar, and then we're going to have uh, two electrons. Uh, the voltage, that was written as a um, reduction potential. If I want to go oxidation, I just flip the sign. So that's going to occur at negative 0 0.28 volts. So let's just clean this up here, and then we can make our observations here. Um, great. Uh, lowest common multiple here is just 2 and 2, so those are going to cancel out here. We're going to end up having uh, the waters add up. Water plus 2 water means we have 3 waters on the left side. I'm just going to copy these other ones down. So I have half an O2 plus 2H plus at a 10 to the negative 7 molar, uh, plus an H2. I'm just going to put all the reactants on the right-hand side. Back with a voltaic cell, uh, half of it occurred on one side, half of it occurred on the other side. This time, because we were non-spontaneous, we can do this all one in the same cell. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have H plus and 2 hydroxide, both at neutral concentrations. 2H plus and 2 OH minus actually ends up forming two waters. Right? So I can actually just sort of condense those together. Well, since I have three waters and two waters, why not cancel the two waters on this side here and actually just make this one water? So overall, your equation is actually back to that electrolysis of water. We're using an electrical circuit, an external power supply. We're causing this to rip apart to become half an O2 and H2. What voltage do we need to supply? Why is it not spontaneous? We're going to go negative 0.82 minus uh, 0.41. And this is going to end up uh, giving you a total negative 1.23 volts. 
For all these electrolytic cells here, we expect it to be negative. This is a non-spontaneous reaction. You need to supply at least 1.23 volts for this to actually occur. What observations will we make? Well, for the anode, the positive side is the oxidation. So it's actually the water that's going to swim up close to the carbon. Water is going to bubble off. We're going to get uh, oxygen at the anode. So we have uh, bubbles of oxygen forming on the carbon side. They're going to end up forming H+. Plus. That would naturally mean it's actually making more acidic. But this 10 negative guarantees me, nope, I'm still going to be neutral. So I'm still going to produce a little bit of H+, plus, but not any more than I would have in neutral solution. And that's when I drop off my electrons. Again, the electrode itself isn't actually doing anything. It's just a temporary holding place for those electrons. The electrons are attracted by the positive end of the battery. They go up. They flow anode to cathode. I'm forcing this reaction to occur. On the other side, water actually does a disproportionation. Water, other water molecules swim up close to the platinum side. Water actually bubbles, bubbles of hydrogen. So on this side here, we're going to form bubbles of hydrogen. We are producing hydroxide, which would normally say basic. But again, it doesn't create any more hydroxide than I would have in a neutral solution anyways. So if I had an indicator, it's not going to change color here. But we're going to form bubbles of both on either side here. And that's when it's going to pick up electrons. There's going to be no mass change because there's no solids depositing. The electrons themselves aren't oxidizing or anything like that. But we've actually found negative 1.23. So in some sense, the K plus and the F minus, both of them were spectators. Both of them didn't do anything because they're so bad at reducing, so bad at oxidizing. Water would actually perform both uh, uh, reactions. So let's write the standard words here. Uh, water uh, undergoes a disproportionation reaction. Remember, that was the fancy word for proportionation. That's the fancy word for one chemical actually doing both uh, oxidation and re reduction. Water actually undergoes disproportionation, um, uh, making both K plus and F minus just spectators. Those actually don't react. K plus and F minus are actually aren't in the overall redox expression. Okay. Um, there is one key difference, though, uh, especially when we're dealing with trying to use uh, electricity to actually run a reaction. We need to make sure that the solution is conductive. Usually, if you just have pure water, technically this equation here should already work. To help with the conducting a solution, to help sort of complete the circuit here, we usually do throw in a salt. Even if it doesn't participate in the reaction, uh, the salt increases just a general uh, ion concentration for better conductivity. So it's just going to help complete the circuit, even though it doesn't actually, they aren't the ones that actually do the oxidation or the reduction reaction, um, uh, we still need them to help complete the circuit. Okay. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this last one here. I just want to emphasize there is one exception to these type 2 cells. Uh, we'll see what you get here. Uh, what I want you to do, similar analysis here, I want you to do the electrolysis of, uh, let's go one molar this time, uh, let's take uh, sodium, uh, sure, let's go back to sodium chloride. And we're still going to use inert electrodes. Uh, next day, we're going to start making the electrodes possibly uh, react as well. As you're doing this here, I'm just going to hint at what you're going to do. The Na, the Cl, tells you you have Na plus and Cl minus. That lattice here is completely ripped apart. I'm not going to see it as a compound. Be really careful. Water is super annoying. We have one molar and we have aqueous. That actually tells you you actually have water as well. So just like earlier, we have the ions formed from the salt, but we actually do have water. Start from the top left and go downwards. So start from this top left. These, these are the strongest oxidizing agents. Go downwards. Try to find your matches. I'm just going to hint at them there. Because we're aqueous, we have water. We have water. We have Na+. You should find that the water reduces first. That's that equation. I'm going to let you uh, write it out there. Then you start from the bottom right here. These are the best guys that oxidizes. Right. It's the same procedure as before, but the chemicals we're looking at are actually so bad, you're actually having to look fairly far down before you find your match. What I want to show you as an exception here is this overpotential effect. On the right-hand side, we do run into water. We run into Cl-. minus. We run into water uh, as well. Right. If I was doing this to the letter, Water should actually oxidize because it was lower then. This overpotential here is actually an exception. It's an exception that any sp anything or any species uh, in the bracket actually, on this side here is oxidation, 
actually oxidize before uh, water, and this is just an experimental finding. It has to do with something, uh, it's called an overpotential. It's a voltage that, as the reaction is occurring, um, experimentally chloride is actually oxidizing worse than water. But uh, what I see is any of these chemicals in the bracket, really they only always test you just chloride and bromide. If you see these ones, even though you did run into water first, um, I want you to actually say it's actually the chloride that actually undergoes. The oxidation for this reaction is 2 chloride becoming Cl2 and 2 electrons. The voltage is still going to be negative 1.36. That actually is uh, smaller than the negative 0.82 it would have been, but that's an experimental finding, especially if the concentration of chloride is high. Right? If we have a dilute sample of chloride, you could argue, well, there's more waters around. Water gets to do the oxidation. Just treat that as an exception. Anything in the square bracket actually oxidizes before water does. Similarly, on the other side, although I rarely see this, but you can say for reduction, water was supposed to reduce, but if I had iron 2, if I had chromium, if I had zinc, these ones experimentally actually reduce first. Why don't they put those higher than water then? Well, they still have to occur uh, at their corresponding voltages. Okay. So I'll leave you to finish out that question, and we'll flesh it out some more tomorrow. Thanks, guys.